This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Management of relationships within the supply chain. Under this heading, we first deal briefly with what's known as lean synchronization. Essentially, lean synchronization uh, is really referring to a kind of just in time system. It means that products and services are always delivered uh, to exactly match what customers want in the exact quantities and that are required time and place of delivery. And in particular, there are no inventory buffers. So it's very much a, a pool system. Uh, the customer sends an order in uh, and in response to that order, the company uh, orders raw materials or brings materials out of inventory uh, and produces the goods which then go directly to the customer. This means it's, it's as I think we've said before, it has to work like uh, clockwork. Now a couple of companies which made great use of this, uh, there is Toyota, uh, but one I'll just talk about briefly is Dell, uh, Dell Computers. Now Dell, um, maybe 10 years ago, was a fantastically successful and very large uh, computer manufacturer. They've, I think, suffered a little bit now from the onslaught of manufacturers like uh, Lenovo. Hewlett-Packard, of course, puts up great competition. Uh, but Dell was the last, if not uh, one of the last, uh, producers of computers who actually produced in the USA rather than subcontracting, outsourcing it, offshoring it to someone much more cheap. And basically what Dell did was it would have orders coming in principally through the internet uh, and people could uh, tailor their computers, what size of disk, what types of memory, size of memory and so on, what size of monitor and type of keyboard and uh, whether they uh, you know, required a you know a kind of smart card reader, an optical disc reader, whatever. There was a lot of customization you could do, and all of these orders would come flooding in, really continually, uh, to their system. And what Dell did was every uh, hour it consolidated these orders, so <clears throat> it would go through the orders and would work out you know how many. 250 gigabyte uh, hard drives it required, how many terabyte hard drives it required, how many uh, uh, particular type of uh, ROM and RAM it needed and so on. It would kind of add all of these input requirements up and it would send orders out every hour and its suppliers had one hour uh, to deliver those parts to the Dell factory. So basically the arrangement was a bit like this. Here you had the Dell factory and all around it were kind of delivery bays. And obviously if you're only giving your suppliers an hour to supply to you, they must be very close indeed, you know. So they're all in a, in a great big kind of industrial park. So the, the lorry would come from the uh, component manufacturer and it would kind of back into a uh, park in the delivery bay. It would wait there uh, and goods were taken off this uh, lorry and they were put directly into production. They didn't go through any kind of inventory, they went directly from the lorry onto the production line. And then when the lorry was empty, it would go away and another lorry would back in in its place with more of those particular components and so on. Which meant that the only inventory that Dell had was really what was like work in progress as it went around the production line. That was pretty quick. Uh, I mean, that was, you know, certainly less than an hour actually making the thing. And then uh, it would run the computers for a couple of hours to, to make sure that when they heated up and so on that the... You know, all the connections were sound, there was a bit of, bit of quality control, and then they'd be immediately dispatched to the consumer. Which meant that Dell had effectively no, hardly any inventory whatsoever. 
No inventory of raw materials, certainly, a little bit of work in progress, and really goods in transit, essentially, going to their suppliers. That kept things very cheap for Dell, and also meant that it could be very flexible in manufacturing. And if you're only making to order, then you're not going to be any left with any goods uh, which are unsold. Uh, the problem, of course, arises if, if one of these uh, manufacturers had some sort of manufacturing problem, uh, and you can't get your hard disks to put into the Dell machines, and of course, the whole thing grinds to a halt. So, although um, it keeps inventory down, this this thing that there's no inventory buffers can be you know, a weak point. I mentioned, I think, in the last lecture uh, about uh, Toyota flying in goods to the UK for their cars uh, and uh, air travel being suspended for a week or so. They very quickly ran out of these components uh, and were beginning to find it really quite difficult to continue with the, the, the manufacturing plants, even though these components were relatively small compared to the overall components that went into a car. So, uh, compared to traditional manufacturing, uh, which has inventory buffers, they have inventory holding costs, relatively slow uh, throughput, maybe less flexibility to uh, change production, uh, because uh, then if you wanted to quickly change production from one thing to another, you'd have to have a buffer of each, really, each type of inventory, uh, and therefore maybe you didn't encourage that and that maybe would hurt your relationship a little bit with your customers who maybe wanted flexibility. Now it's obvious uh, here that in Dell, uh, Dell worked very closely indeed with its suppliers. They had to be more or less on site, they had to be willing to, 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 to work to Dell's timetable and to respond very quickly with goods of the right type, quantity and quality. Uh, uh, the uh, overall types of uh, relationship between suppliers and uh, customers is as follows. So supply chain relational management here is looking at the interfaces between organizations supplying goods uh, and the organization essentially buying those goods or services to maximize their value. And there are several types of uh, a relationship which can be uh, discovered uh, in uh, here uh, transactional contractual value-added collaborative and partnership and again th these are well explained in the notes uh, I'll just mention a couple of these uh, here and you can read through the rest but think of transactional as a relationship with your supplier which is to all intents and purposes regarded as once-off It is for only the life of that transaction. You send out the goods, they send you the goods in, and you, you inspect them and you pay them, and that's kind of it. There's no real ongoing relationship. Uh, and this tends to be a very kind of kind of strict stick, strict kind of stern relationship. Uh, you would be you know, trying to beat these people down to the lowest, lowest possible cost almost because as far as you're concerned you don't have to build up any friendship with them any kind of loyalty with them you'd be uh, inspecting their goods if you saw the smallest thing wrong with these goods you'd be asking for big discounts and so on there it was really what's in it for me now for this one off transaction uh, and then uh, if we go down to value added uh, here this is uh, a little bit more where they get a bit closer together. This is maybe where the uh, uh, supplier begins maybe to say, well, I could tailor make those goods for you. Uh, I could make them just slightly special and you know, that would help you make slightly special products. I could tweak them a little bit and, and so on. Uh, so, so you're not just making goods, you're adding a little bit of extra value to those goods by making maybe special goods for the person you're selling them to there. And the idea is that if you have a supplier who makes goods a little bit special for you uh, and you buy these, there's a kind of mutuality going on here, mutual dependence here. Uh, they want to keep coming back to you because of these goods. Uh, and these people, you know, uh, find it worthwhile cooperating rather more with you because they're trying to build this longer term type relationship. 
collaborative would go on down and uh, look at maybe uh, collaborating on the production of new products. Uh, so they would maybe do research and development together. Uh, and again, of course, this is going to really tie them together much more uh, closely. One supplier uh, who's worked with you to help you make special components that you're putting into your special new product is building up the, the mutual dependence in one another and the ongoing long-term relationship. And finally, there's a partnership uh, here where it, it, it goes even more than collaborative. You, you are almost like partners. I make the components, you put them together and sell them, and we're working very closely together indeed. Now, to contrast it with the, uh, the transactional one here, if I supplied somebody with goods, my partner with goods, let's say it was a, a problem with these components, they didn't work, rather than my customer coming at me and saying, well, we want a big discount because you, you know, you've supplied goods of interior, inferior quality, it would be recognised by both parties that, that these goods of inferior quality were bad for both of us. And my customer would say, look, this has happened. Uh, it wasn't great for us because we started making finished goods that were inferior. How can we stop it happening again? It is to both our advantages that these supplies, the supply relationship works better because we're in it, we're in it together. We're partners rather than this, I'm buying from you, you're selling to me, this kind of confrontational attitude that there is in the transactional relationship. Materials Resource Planning, MRP, is just a name given. Again, it's very dependent on IT, as a lot of this just-in-time inventory is, to, to, to be able to place all of these orders quickly enough and to keep track of them and uh, the like. Materials Resource Planning is like what Dell was doing. It got the orders coming in. Based on those orders, it could it kind of like explode out into a list of parts needed, and you use this list of parts to place orders with your suppliers so that you were managing the materials that you needed for the uh, production. There's another uh, MRP, sometimes this is called MRP1, MRP2 is uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing resource planning. Manufacturing resource planning is planning not just the materials, but also, say, time and machines, also uh, allocating people to jobs. So the whole manufacturing resource, materials, people and machinery, uh, were all organised, timetable, coordinated uh, to respond quickly to orders. Finally, in this uh, uh, chapter, uh, there is just to mention what's called statistical process uh, control. This leads into the next chapter, which which looks at uh, quality. Uh, but as you are uh, producing goods, uh, it makes sense, obviously, uh, that some sort of quality control check is performed on the goods you're producing. So if you were, let's say, making simple bits of metal uh, that were supposed to be exactly, you know, 40 centimetres long, uh, then it would make sense that from time to time you, you take one of these bits of metal off the production line and you measure it to make sure that the machine setting hasn't slipped or something gone wrong and it's still exactly the required 40 centimetres long. Now, inevitably, uh, as we have here, the, 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 just because it's machinery and so on, the length will jiggle up and down a little bit. It might only be fractions of a millimetre, but you're really going to be 40.000000000 centimetres long. It's going to be you know, going a little bit. And, and for most of the time, for most components, that's you know, a fraction of a millimetre up and down is not going to make very much difference. So that's just, this is what we're going to be showing here, that if this is kind of length here, and as we're going along producing, we, we see these little, little small variations here. Uh, and we don't get too worried about it. It's, it jiggles up and down, basically, slightly randomly. But then what we should be alert to 
is if it begins going wrong kind of consistently let's say producing a longer length than 40 centimeters over and over and over and over again at some point what they call the upper control limit we say right this has gone on long enough uh, <coughs> there is evidence now that, that this is not just a random variation but that something and more material is happening I have to step in and I have to take corrective action so this is uh, basically uses statistics you know it's almost like saying well how many times does a an over length item have to be produced in a row before we get worried or, or maybe what's the maximum uh, over length that we're going to tolerate before we get worried and that we take corrective action so it's it's uh, keeping an eye on basically the quality of production and making sure that nothing has slipped.